So today I'll be talking to you about, still got to do, has to do with stents, as, as that's one of the areas that we're focusing on over at the uh, Stone Center Research Lab. But this is a new and exciting area that we've just sort of gotten into over the past few months. And um, hopefully by the end of this, you'll be just as excited as I am, and Ben, of course, as well, about the potentials that this may have to end your urology and maybe potentially even beyond. So as a brief outline, I'll be briefly talking about ureter physiology, um, just talking about where does uh, ureter peristalsis come from, where does it start, uh, the ureter, ureter response to obstruction, and then a very interesting question of what do stents do to the urinary system, what do they really do, as opposed to what they're supposed to do. Um, then we'll be looking specifically at the ureter response to stents, and that's uh, where I'll be highlighting some of the um, experiments and, and uh, trials we've run over the past uh, couple of months. And then last but not least is the clinical bit that most of you will have to unfortunately sit through some basic science through to get to. But uh, I promise I won't show any gels or western blots or any of that kind of stuff. So, And the one question that I'd like for you to think about as I'm going through this is just sort of like, you know, do we need stents? Are they really beneficial or are they doing more harm? Um, to the patient than helping. So briefly, I'm sure you're quite familiar with the um, uh, ureteral structure, but the, the ureters are the retroperitoneal structures that transport urine between the kidneys and the bladder, and they're typically um, 22 to 30 centimeters in length. And there are three specific points, uh, the UPJ, the UVJ, as well as where the ureters cross the iliac vessel, where they naturally narrow a bit. and um, these um, areas along the uh, ureter are actually quite important in regulating uh, ureter peristalsis and pre preventing vesicular ureter reflux and, and so on and so forth. So as far as ureter physiology is concerned, the ureters consist of um, a transitional epithelium, which I'll show you is this area. Um, excuse me the sort of light grayish parts around the, uh, the lumen. Lamella propria, which consists of longitudinal and circular smooth muscles, as well as the adventitia, which uh, contains the blood vessels and the lymphatics. Now, in terms of importance for uh, ureter peristalsis, there are two types of smooth muscle layers. And so there's the uh, inner hel helical layer, which is found in the sort of darker purpley area here, as well as the outer mesh-like layer. And the um, inner hel helical layer is important for uh, mediating um, and uh, ureteral peristalsis, whereas the outer mesh layer is there for structural support. So in terms of the initiation of peristalsis, um, essentially what it is, and I was never really quite aware of, of how uh, detailed uh, this all works and what's all involved. Never really thought about it until we started this uh, part of the, the project. And essentially, the downstream transport of urine between the kidneys and the bladder requires a very fine tuned coordination between smooth muscles as well as neurotransmission. So, essentially, uh, what happens is if you now remember back to your medical school or potentially your basic, you know, your, your Bachelor of Science days. Uh, what happens is there's a triggering of an action potential, which essentially is membrane depolarization, that results in the influx of calcium into, uh, into the cell. Then agonists such as norepinephrine, angiotensin, and, and so on and so forth, uh, will also bind to their receptor, activate uh, a protein kinases and IP3, which results in essentially more calcium being released into uh, the cells. The calcium then binds to um, calmodulin, that in, uh, in turn um, leads to the activation of um, myelin light chain kinase and phosphorylation of, of myelin, and then eventually you get the uh, contraction of the smooth muscle, and then the activity of uh, myosin phosphatase dephosphorylase and results in the relaxation of smooth muscle activity. So. That's kind of the basis of what goes on as the ureter peristalsis. 
But what triggers uh, peristalsis? And it's quite interesting. If you look through the literature, there's, there's quite a few papers. Nobody really actually has identified the exact point within the kidney where it all originates. There's some theories around it. And, you know, I guess over the years there's a bit of a consensus. Um, and there's been certain stainings and, and, and uh, immunohistochemistry that's been done that seems to suggest that um, ureteral peristalsis originates in the proximal uh, pelvic helical regions of the renal pelvis. Essentially, this region uh, contains uh, a network of cells that are, um, resemble structurally, as well as in terms of their protein expression, the interstitial cells of Kajal, which are the pacemaker cells found in the gastrointestinal tract. Um, in addition to that, there's also these, what they call atypical smooth muscle cells, which contain um, calcium ion channels called HCN3 channels. And the reason why that's important is because uh, those channels are also uh, present in pacemaker cells uh, in, in, the, uh, in the heart. So in this particular, like in the proximal uh, pelvic helical regions, both cell types are grouped together to form these pacemaker subunits. And um, similarly to an action potential, for instance, where, you know, things fire all the time, but the actual um, action potential doesn't get transmitted until a certain threshold is achieved, um, uh, ureteral peristalsis is similar. So each of these um, pacemaker subunits fires uh, uh, quite consistently. But it's the summation of multiple subunits that's triggered by, um, again, there's neurotransmitter involvement, but at the same time also um, there must be some sort of a pressure signal involved as well that tells uh, the kidney that it's time to peristalse the ureter and move the urine from the kidney down to the bladder. Um, so these subunits, these pacemaker subunits are closely uh, opposed to typical smooth muscle cells, so once they fire, they pass on this action potential essentially between smooth muscle cells that uh, uh, line the ureter and the urinary system and uh, thus propel the uh, urine into the bladder. Now, the, um, if you look at the number of these uh, subunits, uh, they are more prominent in the renal pelvis area and decrease in number as you move down from the proximal to the distal ureter. So what about the effects of ureteral obstruction on, on peristalsis? Um, of course, obstruction, be it a stone or, or any other type of obstruction, uh, it results in ureteral strengthening and uh, distension. Um, and essentially stimulates sensory neurons. And what uh, essentially happens then is that results in pain and an increase in the rate and amplitude of contraction, and hence uh, a peristalsis. And the idea is that because something's obstructing the ureter, it wants to get rid of it. So it, it continuously peristalsis to try and push it out. And here's just an example of a, of a study that was uh, performed by uh, Laird et al., where they showed uh, in a rat model of partial ureter obstruction that the amplitude of uh, a peristalsis is significantly increased when you have a partial extraction. And interestingly, even after it's expelled, in this case they used um, uh, artificial uh, um, stones. Now, how they got them into the rat ureter, I'm not entirely sure. It must have been quite the undertaking. But even after those have been expelled already, you can see that the uh, peristalsis or the peristaltic activity is still quite high. Now, when it's completely blocked, the peristalsis significantly decreases and almost and not there. And of course, if you like it, you have no uh, uh, peristalsis at all. So the idea, you've got an obstruction, naturally peristalsis, at least with a partial obstruction, peristalsis increases significantly. Try and get rid of that. So now let's turn to the stented ureter. What about the stented ureter? Well, again, you know, Despite its uh, clinical application, it's you know quite widely used, as you know, in your own uh, from your own practices and, and as you've gone through residency and so on and so forth. Uh, the clinical role and value of it is, is still somewhat poorly understood. Um, and again, we can certainly discuss this uh, at the end of the talk. Uh, I'm interested to see what your thoughts are on this. But I think, at least from a basic scientist perspective, looking in, 
you know, my impression has always been the stent is a tool we have that we know it helps, but we don't really know what it does, so we use it. Um, so stents provide drainage of the upper tracts in case of obstruction. Uh, essentially what they do is they dilate the ureter and facilitate urinary flow past that obstruction. But here's the question. Since they represent a partial obstruction, if you think about it, do they act by increasing peristalsis as we've just seen? So the question that you know, we've asked ourselves is what do they really do? And certainly um, there's been some studies uh, done on, on um, excuse me, on the um, patient morbidity due to ureteral stents, and, and Samir gave quite a great talk uh, a couple of months ago on, on some of these, so I don't want to go into great detail. But here's a, a pilot study that actually, that was provided by uh, Ben Chu, who of course you all know very well, um, during his fellowship in London. And basically what they looked at is how does the stent move as the patient goes through their daily activity and as they go through different motions. And interestingly enough, the stent was found to move caudally one centimeter when the patient changes from the supine to the sitting position. It changes about 2.3 centimeters when the patient goes from supine to standing, uh, again caudally, and then um, it uh, changes about 2.7 centimeters in cephalad when the patient goes from sitting to bending over. So as you can imagine, considering that the ureter and the kidney, and of course the bladder, which is where these dents are anchored, those are kind of restricted areas in the sense that as the patient moves, the stent moves, they're going to start to irritate things um, along the way. So what does that result in? And again, we uh, performed a study a few years ago where we actually uh, developed an in vitro model uh, for studying stent-induced cell injury. And essentially it was quite simple. We, we grew some um, tissue culture cell lines, bladder cell lines, and kidney cell lines, took a stent piece, essentially just rotated a, a petri dish so that the stent piece would roll across the monolayer and then looked at pro-inflammatory cytokines to see what kind of response you get. And sure enough, without going into any detail, uh, uh, sort of the overall result was that indeed when you use just a regular stent, um, you do get an increase in pro-inflammatory pro cytokine production by these cell lines. And then um, in this particular study, we also added fracticine as an antimicrobial, but at the same time, it also has anti-inflammatory activity. Um, when you add a tracticine in either as a, as a liquid or in a uh, um, form of a tracticine with stent, which was popular at the time, um, that actually decreased the inflammatory response. So rather than focusing on the drug elution or anything like that, what I want to get across is that, of course, stent irritation does result in an inflammatory response. And this has also been shown uh, in vivo, and uh, this paper was uh, published a couple, um, a couple of years ago, no, excuse me, just recently, this is the latest one, um, where we did some work on our the biodegradable stent, and within that, um, we also evaluated information on day 28 based on histological analysis and the assignment of a mean severity score by a pathologist. And when you look at the um, control stented ureters, you uh, notice that the inflammation within the kidney, the proximal ureter, the mid ureter, the distal ureter, as well as the bladder, is always higher than the uh, polaris stented side versus either a non-stented, the polaris non-stented side, or in the case with the softer material, uh, the European stem. So, again, this shows that even in vivo you have significant amounts of inflammation. Here's just a picture of, of the bladder. You can certainly see the irritation on the bladder of the fluid when you open it up. So next, I, I brought it up earlier, the whole idea of uh, vesicular reflux. And here's a study uh, that was performed by Mosley et al. And um, basically, they look, it was a prospective study of, of 30, 30 renal units in 27 patients that were stented. And they essentially found that um, through radiological examination that during the filling phase, um, reflux or, or 
vesicular ureter reflux was observed in 63% of the renal units, whereas during the voiding phase, it, that increased significantly to 80% of the renal units. So the idea being that if a stent in place, vesicular ureter reflux is significantly increased. And it's believed that that's because the, the stent acts as an elongation of the bladder, so that when pressure inside the bladder increases, that gets uh, transmitted back into the uh, uh, towards the kidney and hence causes the urinary flow to go backwards. So now having looked at or established, I suppose, in a way that you know stents cause inflammation, they cause vesicular ureter vesicular reflux. What about peristalsis? Because again, we've kind of learned and we know that a stent is placed to promote a urinary flow um, in the uh, presence of an obstruction. So peristalsis is something that's required for urinary flow. And stents being a partial obstruction, if uh, we think about the obstruction of a stone as I've shown you earlier, technically peristalsis should be increased. But is that in fact what happens? And there have been uh, a few studies uh, done uh, here's one by Venkatesh uh, that uh, has essentially shown that uh, ureter peristalsis actually decreases um, uh, significantly. In this case, they used a 4.8 French stem or a 7 French stem. It, de excuse me, it decreases significantly as the ureter uh, increases. So peristalsis is negatively affected by placing a stent. And a similar study by uh, Kinnett all shows. Uh, basically the same. This was done in, uh, in, in pigs, and essentially um, they studied change in peristaltic activity uh, as well. And um, in this particular study, they had two groups. One had a stent inserted the day of the study, so that's a short-term stent of patients, whereas in the other group, uh, the animals were actually had a stent indwelling for six to eight weeks. And on the day of the study, they removed that stent and placed a new one. Um, and so, essentially, again, you can certainly see that in the six to eight week animals, the peristalsis is significantly um, uh, decreased. Uh, now, interesting enough, as you increase diuresis, that difference in terms of peristaltic activity actually decreases. But again, the study shows that with a stent in place, over time, peristalsis is negatively affected. So then, what does that result in? And again, I come back to uh, one of the biodegradable stent studies we did, and uh, the reason I come back is because it was, it's kind of convenient to come, you know, to show you the control stented animal results rather than the European. Uh, and essentially, when you uh, look at it, hydronephrosis over time increases significantly in the Polaris study group versus, again, in this case, we compared to the European group, which is softer material. But the idea I'd like for you to get out of this is that you know, peristalsis stops in the stent of the ureter and hydronephrosis also increases significantly over time. So, again, I come back to the question, do stents do more harm than they do good? And knowing, basically, or having learned what, what I've just shown you about the effects of stents, the question is, what actually causes ureteral aperistalsis uh, in the presence of, of, of a stent? Um, specifically, what we've been trying to answer, or we've been looking into, is what are some potential molecular mechanisms that are involved in this? Um, with the idea down the road uh, being that the identification of specific targets may drive the design of future therapeutic agents to maybe one day I don't know, replace a stent, maybe one day we can have a magic drug that we give patients prior to stone surgery where the ureter dilates and peristalsis magically or at a perfect rate that, that promotes uh, stone fragment passage or what have you. But um, that, that's the overall idea, trying to identify targets that, that we can maybe design new and novel therapies towards. But where do you begin? That's the question. I mean, we're looking at we're looking for targets, and, and where do you get it again? And we've looked through the literature, and it turns out that our good friend, the hedgehog signaling mechanism uh, pathway, actually plays a role in the development 
uh, of the urinary system. And I know that it's quite convenient that I'm giving my talk now, but I know that Ralph Butchin um, gave a talk here, uh, again, I think it was about a month ago, on hedgehogs. So I don't want to go into too much detail because I'm sure you guys are now experts on how it all works. But just to refresh your memory, um, hedgehog, in the absence of um, um, the hedgehog itself, uh, a protein called smoothened uh, inactivates attached, and hence you don't get any target gene expression. In the case where hedgehog is present, hedgehog will bind, release, um, excuse me, release smoothing that then results in the um, production and release of uh, hedgehog effectors called bleeds of proteins and either uh, results in the activation or repression of gene transcription. Um, so just briefly go over it again, there are three different types of glee proteins. Glee 1, when active, is always a transcriptional activator. Glee 2, depending on the presence or absence of hedgehog, uh, the ligand is either an activator or a repressor. Um, and Glee 2 has to be activated in order for Glee 1 to be produced. And then Glee 3 is uh, always a repressor, but the strength of it uh, depends on the presence or absence of, of hedgehog. And I promise that's a deep detail, the level of detail I'm going to go into on this. So just to show you the uh, a bit of the more um, pertinent uh, research that's gone into uh, uh, peristalsis and the role of, of glee effectors. So um, Kay Nadal and, and uh, Dr. Rosenblum, who's at the uh, University of Toronto, um, have done some great work uh, on this uh, only a couple of years ago where they've shown a bifunctional role of hedgehog signaling uh, during the functional development of the ureter. And basically what they've shown is that during early development, hedgehog is required for smooth muscle development, whereas late on, uh, later on during development, it's required for KIT and HCN3 expression, which, if you recall, back at the beginning of my talk, I mentioned the HCN3 um, as being part of the pacemaker cells in the renal pelvis. Uh, KIT is also part of these uh, interstitial cells of kajal like cells in the renal pelvis. So essentially, uh, what they've shown is that hedgehog is required for pacemaker function. But again, remember, it's, in the, it's during development. Another study by uh, Uital has actually shown that when you remove sonic hedgehog, it actually results in hydroyurid and hydronephrosis, again, in the develop, uh, during development. And this is uh, caused by the Rasmus If you look on the left hand side, here's your well type. Um, the well type images, and you can see nice development over time. MDB newborn, and this after four months. And then when you take away mm -hmm. hedgehog, you can certainly see the hydrogen as well as the development of hydronephrosis over time as well. Again, here's the order. So there's a clear role for hedgehog in. Uh, the development of the urinary system, uh, smooth muscle activity, uh, and ureteral peristalsis. So, we decided we should maybe start by looking at hedgehog because, I mean, if it's involved during development, maybe it's also in, in, involved in regulating ureteral peristalsis in the developed ureter. So, again, we come back to the histology slides that we have from our degradable stent study. And in this study, we conveniently had 13 control pigs. Um, and essentially, we had tissues collected at 2, 4, 7, 10 days, uh, excuse me, weeks post stent insertion. And the important point to make here is that the 10 week animals actually had the stent removed at 7 weeks. And that was just to normalize compared to uh, when the European stents were all gone. The reason why this is a convenient point is because it now allows us to look at the 10 week animals and see because they've had a three-week recovery period for things to heal up in the wood and the bladder and so on and so forth, to see how uh, the expression of, of uh, some of these proteins are affected. So what we did was we compared uh, sonic hedgehog and glee expression in stented versus non-stented approximal ureters in these animals. And here's just a representation from one particular animal. And uh, the first, as indicated, is an HV stadium. And what I really just want to point out is, again, the non-stented um, side doesn't show any 
information that was present in the state itself, and this is also shown by CD31 state. Uh, specifically for BLE1, and this is a uh, represent the smooth, smooth muscle cell. So what we found was that in the stented ureter, GLE1 expression was completely gone compared to the non-stented ureters. And again, remember this is in the same animals because they were unilaterally stented, so each animal served as its own control. When you then look at hedgehog, which is ligand that is required for GLE expression, you can also see differences, although not quite as uh, uh, strong or striking as for GLE1 in the expression of, of sonic hedgehog within the uh, urethelium. So when you look at that across the board in terms of the time course and, and, and you know, looking at the data, putting the data together for all the animals, what we noticed was that in red we've got inflammation in, in, in blue, we've got blue or one expression, that uh, in the absence, so in the unstinted animals, we get inflammation uh, in the proximal area is pretty much non-existent, and blue one expression over time increases and then increases in the 7 to 10. When you look at the stented side, the pattern is slightly different. Inflammation increases between two to four weeks, then decreases as the stent remains in dwelling, and then remains relatively stable after you uh, remove the stent. Now when you look at the blue one expression, uh, what happens is that initially the blue one expression decreases two to four weeks, which if I bring it back to the, uh, the solid slides, we just saw for that one particular animal, and that's representative for all of them. Uh, you can see that's uh, the corresponds to decrease in blue one expression. And then again, as the river begins to recover, get used to the presence of the stem, blue one expression begins to go up again. Now, one interesting Hard to note is that again, pretend unstented stented uh, kidneys, uh, excuse me, proximal areas in the same animal. As the one expression decreases in the stented side, it appears to increase in that stented side. So there may be a potential compensatory mechanism going on whereby the uh, unstented side uh, makes up for the loss of, in this case, the one expression or whatever it's involved in. Um, uh, in the in the stented side, so that's certainly quite interesting. And again, this kind of shows the same results. Now, when you look at the uh, epithelial expression of, of sonic hedgehog, again, the differences aren't quite as striking, but you, you do see a, 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 an increase in, in hedgehog expression uh, in or, yeah, expression in the uh, stented uh, excuse me unstented versus the stented side. So there's a slight decrease. Now, having said that, because of the multiple role of sonic hedgehog, it's quite possible that um, uh, uh, we may not capture uh, any change in overall hedgehog expression um, um, that corresponds to the glee one decrease in glee one expression in, in the uh, 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 in the smooth muscle because, like I said, sonic hedgehog is involved in so many different pathways. So. Um, the difference might just not be big enough to, to, to recognize globally. So then the question that is kind of obviously comes up is how does the decrease in smooth muscle glee one expression affect uh, smooth muscle activity? So we performed another study where we stented eight pigs unilaterally using a uh, biostable flare stent um, so that again each pig can act as its own control. We quantified peristalsis uh, on the day of sacrifice by opening it up and actually looked at it. Harvested the urinary systems on days two and seven, a post stent insertion, um, and uh, actually looked at, other than doing, of course, histological staining to, to verify our previous results, also compared smooth muscle activity by looking at the force generation by the smooth muscles in the stented versus non stented ureters. And we also, in this particular group, uh, experiment, we also Perform the same analysis on four control animals that we had never actually stented. So those act as true controls. So when you look at the ureteral diameter, as expected over time, the ureteral diameter does increase compared to control and unstented animals. And you can certainly see in these pictures that you know, there is a significant increase in the uh, 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 diameter of the ureter as the 
So, in terms of ureteral peristalsis, again, controls in that an unstented uh, um, ureters had similar uh, peristaltic activity as determined by uh, the scoring system that we developed um, based on whether or not the ureter was peristalsis or, or, or greater or less than 0.5 on average, uh, and whether it was actually excitable by physically, you know, uh, and, and pushing, pushing the press on it uh, to see what the, what the response. And again, stented um, and uh, unstented, excuse me, stented animals had significantly less usual peristalsis compared to controls or unstented, the unstented uh, ureters. Um, and interesting enough, even after we removed the stents, we left the animals open for another half hour to see if removing the stent caused peristalsis to recover, but it, it didn't either. Um, but then again, the question would be, how much time is really required for that? Now, looking at smooth muscle activity, because again, glee one expression significantly decreased in smooth muscle of stented animal, uh, uh, yeah, in stented animals, uh, of the uh, smooth muscle of the ureter. Um, what does that mean? How does that translate to uh, uh, smooth muscle activity? And again, we, we measured in collaboration with Chan Sao over at, um, at St. Paul's Hospital, who's an expert in smooth muscle um, physiology and, and measuring activity and so on and so forth. You can uh, see that, again, control ureters, um, as well as unstanded ureters, generate significantly more force uh, compared to the smooth muscle uh, of the standard ureters. <laughs> and here's a comparison of that. This graph shows uh, this data uh, as a percentage of the contralateral um, unstented side for each of the stent ureters. And again, that also shows that uh, um, um, in control animals, the both sides had a very similar uh, uh, um, force production, whereas uh, in 48 hour stented animals, they only showed 39.3% uh, of the force production compared to the um, unstented sides, and that uh, increased back after seven days. So it, it seems to suggest that there might be some sort of a, uh, a mechanism where it kind of rebounds. In terms of correlation of in vivo and in vitro smooth muscle activity, essentially this graph shows that increased force production correlates with increased peristaltic activity observed in each animal prior to tip tissue harvest. As, and um, we also found that increased ureteral diameter correlates with decreased force production by smooth muscle in the stented ureters. So to, to summarize the overall findings, so again, ureteral stenting results in significant decrease in smooth muscle activity and overall peristaltic activity. Um, decreased peristalsis results in lower urinary flow and increased vesicular ureter reflux, which results in hydrogenophosis. So, again, I come back to this. It begs the question, are stents beneficial or not? And now comes the clinical bit. So, um, there have been several studies, and, and this has certainly been discussed at the, some of the urology meetings, uh, especially uh, over the last couple of years, you know, do we stand or do we not stand? That's the question. Here's a, here's a study that, that looked at uh, as well and, and uh, standing uh, or not standing uh, prior to the procedure. And essentially what they found that there was an overall stone free rate of 83.7% in non-stented versus 68.6% in stented uh, patients. So the conclusion you could draw from this is that stenting affects the stone free rate. That's an as well. What about ureteroscopy? And there were, again, uh, this was a study performed by uh, Graham Preminger's group back in, in 2002. And essentially, uh, what they found was they looked at uh, post operative symptoms and uh, concluded that routine ureteral stenting does not appear to be warranted in patients who do not require ureteral dilation during ureteroscopy, ureteroscopic procedures. Um, and stent placement following uh, the procedure may be avoided as it uh, was found to reduce operative time, surgical cost, and even patient morbidity. 
And then the last study I wanted to show, uh, again, is a meta-analysis by, by Brian Malaga's group in, in Baltimore. And this analysis included 10 distinct trials, including 441 stented patients, 450 non-stented patients. And the, again, the primary outcome was uh, urologic complications, such as ER visits, hospital readmission, and secondary procedures. And this particular study concluded that there's a slightly lower uh, risk of complication associated with the step placement of a stent after the endoscopy. Um, but it doesn't uh, detect a significant difference in outcome between patients uh, who, who had a stent versus those that don't. So with that, I would like to uh, thank a few people. Uh, our fellow uh, Claudia Janssen, who's uh, done um, uh, a lot of the, well, actually most of the uh, hedgehog work and the analysis and so on and so forth. Wolfgang Jäger, who was uh, part of uh, harvesting the tissues and, and some of the analysis as well. Then uh, our collaborator over at St. Paul's, Dr. Chan Sao. Dr. Butchin, who's been um, very helpful as far as the hedgehog side of things is concerned, has been a great mentor as well. Uh, Dr. Fasley for the pathologist, of course, uh, my colleague uh, Ben Chu. So with that, I welcome any questions or discussions surrounding the idea of are stents really helpful or are they causing more harm? Thank you.